Well, happy Thanksgiving. What a, what a wonderful weekend, and I just want to wish all of you a great Thanksgiving. Uh, whatever your plans are, whatever that's going to look like for you, whether it's something very simple or, or otherwise, just, uh, just a great weekend for us to give thanks to the Lord for all the blessings and all those gifts that we've received from him. I, I think every one of you that are watching this video, uh, you can say that you've been blessed by God in many wonderful ways, and uh, this is a neat, neat weekend to just uh, reflect and to pause and, and to give thanks to him for all, all he's done for us. So happy Thanksgiving to you. Well, one of the things that uh, we focus on here at Bethel Church and, and get excited about is, is those different opportunities that God gives us to share the love of Christ with other people. Now, there's all kinds of different ways we can do that. In, in, in about three weeks from now, on October 30th, which is a Friday and uh, a Friday night, and then Sunday morning on November 1st, we're we're kind of committing that weekend to have have a focus on on God's work through Bethel Church um, around the world, around the globe. Some of those ways that we're involved in in the lives of people uh, in other parts of the world, and and the way that people from our church have been been sent out to other countries and other groups of people, or to other cultures, even here in Canada. We're there sharing about the love of Christ. So, so you can be planning and looking forward to that weekend. It'll be a Friday night service on October 30th and then a Sunday morning service on November 1st. One of those other new ways that we want to share the love of Christ with other, others and, and provide an opportunity for people to understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow uh, Jesus, we're, we're going to be uh, beginning a program here at our church called Alpha. Now, some of you may have heard of Alpha. Alpha is kind of just a, a way to, to, to describe a Christianity 101. It's a, it's a, it's a Bible study course. It's, a, it, it's a, a, a place for conversations and for, for questions, a place where you can learn about some of those, those basic parts of what it means to follow Jesus and to know Jesus. Um, Don and Gwen Day from our church, they've had, they've had some really good experiences and history with Alpha, and they're, they're going to be offering uh, this Alpha program to us in our church, and I'm so excited for that. So we're going to watch a little video about Alpha, and then you're going to hear a little bit more after that. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. Uh, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning.
Good morning, everyone. Just uh, hope everyone's having a great day today. And uh, we thought we would share a little bit what we did this uh, spring and summer, a program we took, which is called Alpha. And um, this is my wife, Gwen, and I'm Dawn, and she's going to share a little bit. Thanks. Um, so Pastor Kelly asked me to describe what Alpha is, and I think if I backed up to begin with, uh, about 20 years ago, Alpha came out with uh, DVDs. And um, we did Alpha at our clubhouse with Rod and Karen Duncalf and a few other families. And we just we gathered together on Sunday evenings. And it was a really uh, fantastic program um, developed by Nikki Gumbel. He is um, a vicar um, and he's in England uh, of a church there. And he was a lawyer and that felt called by God to become a pastor and that has done that ever since. And he developed this uh, course and it's about 11 or 12 weeks long and it's a video series. So nowadays we can just pull it up on YouTube and you can watch the whole series from start to finish. There's one series that is just Nikki talking and it's him giving lectures in his, in his church in, in England. And now this new series is um, young couple Nikki speaks in it, but there's a young couple that travel and they go to different places in the world. And it's a very uh, modern and engaging video series. And they're about an hour long. So what we do with Alpha is everybody watches it. Um, and then we have a discussion time and we are led by questions that Alpha has put together. And there's an Alpha Canada that's a support um, to people uh, hosting Alphas in Canada. Typically they're hosted in churches and you would go and um, watch the video there and then have a small group discussion after the video and usually they provided a meal um, So that's kind of like bring people together, especially unchurched people and you um, Have this together at, at, at a church location um, Then this spring when COVID hit young friends of ours that we've had for years Mike and Donna from Cochrane had started attending the Alliance Church and went to two or three alphas but they were at the end of the alpha program and then COVID hit. And so we had said, you know, let's look it up and see, we could do it with you and start from number one and work through it. And it'd been years for us. So we were excited to try that. And the, it was just like such a highlight of our COVID lockdown time that we could, from our homes in them in Cochrane and another friend in Calgary and us out here, we could watch the uh, new Alpha series uh, for an hour and then have our discussion via Zoom. So I learned Zoom and learned how to send the links sometimes with Donna's help. She's more techie than I am. And together we worked it out and it was just such a, a highlight of our week. And we, you know, we really look forward to having that time with them. And then as the lockdown decreased, we started to get together once in a while outside on our decks. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, Alpha in a nutshell. It's a, it kind of, I would say it um, discusses and opens up what Christianity is from the basics um, in modern language and an interactive way uh, with anybody that's searching and like to know more. So um, yeah, that's, that's Alpha. And uh, I think it helped us grow in our faith and reviewing some of the foundational things, um, you know, like, I don't just really um, great history that they provide in there and the, the history and the truth of the Bible and the circumstances of Christ's death and resurrection and opportunity to experience God and um, open our eyes to the truth of the gospel, really. And yeah, it's very... It's very encouraging in our faith for us that have been in the faith for a long time. And it's very open for those that haven't been in the faith to ask questions and have a free and open dialogue. So now that we can do it from our homes and um, anywhere in Alberta, we have my brother and his wife joining us from north of Edmonton and Mike and Don are joining us again. We have another couple, uh, Mike's brother from, I don't know, northern Alberta somewhere. So because of the technology, now we can do it from the comfort of our homes and um, share and not have the barrier of coming to a church or even the work of having a meal, which is always nice, but this makes it simpler. So um, yeah, so the, we are 
encouraging others to consider hosting an alpha and uh, we would be there to help um, just meet with you if you're interested you have to have a little technology and be able to set up zoom um, meetings and um, access the alpha online or you if you know lockdown doesn't happen you can just do it from the comfort of your home and invite people over but i really encourage people to look at it as an opportunity to share um, the truth of the gospel with others and it'll encourage you in your faith as you walk through it with other people well thank you gwen and don for sharing this with us um, this tool this alpha course and uh, i just pray for each one of us that um, uh, if God is leading us to kind of uh, get involved in this program, that uh, that He'll lead us. I mean, the reality is, this is a tool that that helps us share the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and wow, what a what a reality to know that we have been um, set, saved, we have been set free, we have been brought in um, by Jesus Christ, and we are so thankful for what He has done. And that, I mean, that, that's what we've come to do today. We come to praise him, to praise him for what he has done. Um, the wonderful, um, glorious things that our Lord has done in our lives. And I want to, uh, I want to read this uh, Psalm 111, a beautiful psalm of praise uh, that would align our hearts in this uh, wonderful day that we, where we celebrate Thanksgiving, where we, we recognize that um, that God is the one that gives it all. He is the He is the one who owns owns it all, and everything that we have is a blessing from Him, and it's meant for Him. It's meant for His glory. We are meant to give glory to Him through it all. And so I want to uh, read these words. It says, "Praise the Lord! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the con congregation." Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So let's praise him together. Let's sing to God be the glory.
gonna trust the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the things that we don't deserve, but Lord, you've given them. Lord, let, let us realize that these are not, not for our pleasure, but for yours, and that you might be glorified through what we do, what we say, how we use everything that you've given, because you deserve all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Give thanks for the good days. When the traffic lights all turn green, when promotions come and bad habits are broken. Give thanks for warm meals and the company of friends. Give thanks for undeniable blessings and clear direction. When the music floods your soul and the worship songs flow without effort. Give thanks for coffee and clothing and hope that the two never mix. Give thanks for the mother who battles daily in prayer, for the father working three jobs, for the brothers and sisters who build blanket forts and read bedtime stories. Give thanks for sons and daughters and all our family who remind us of what truly matters. Give thanks for the stranger who holds the door open and the lifelong friend who holds you when life is broken. Give thanks for the hard days, for the phone call that brings life crashing down, for jobs lost and friendships fallen into conflict. Give thanks for the anger that reminds us we are human and the tears that express more than words could ever fathom. 
give thanks. Though the pain is overwhelming, your energy spent, your spirit fallen, and your only option is to fall to your knees before your Holy Father and cry out, God, please help me. For in that moment, his power is made perfect. His love is made evident. He becomes your strength, your comfort, and your salvation. Give thanks for the power of redemption, from Genesis to Revelation, for the endless promises of a God who would rather sacrifice his son than give up on his children. For nail-pierced hands, for brilliant dawns, for the cool touch of rain and the simplicity of a quiet day. For all things great and small, let us give thanks. We are going to take a, a little bit of a break from our Ecclesiastes series just for this morning. And we're going to put a, thank, a focus on, on Thanksgiving Sunday and, and just some of those ways that, that our hearts are being guided to give thanks to the Lord today. We're going to return back to Ecclesiastes next Sunday and, and just carry on uh, with Ecclesiastes for a few more weeks until we get to our, our, our global ministry weekend that is coming up on November 1st. Well, I think for a lot of you, it's often a, a Thanksgiving tradition to just pause and to reflect on, on those things that we're thankful for. That's a good thing for us to do. When we give thanks, uh, we often focus on, on those practical, those, those physical things that, that are in our lives. We, we thank God for our family and for our health, for our friendships, uh, for God's provision, for the way he provides for our, our daily needs. It's really good for us to give thanks to God for all of these things. This morning, what I hope to do is I want to create a, a different kind of a Thanksgiving checklist for us. I want to suggest some things that, that we can thank God for today that don't usually get mentioned around the dinner table. And I want to try to take our thank you to God just, just one step further. It's good for us to say thank you and to just just stop and just give thanks to God. But it's a better thing when we allow the gifts and the blessings that we've received from God to begin to guide our lives and shape our choices and our behaviors and the ways that we live. I am so thankful that God is good. But if I say that that's true, then, then how should I live in response to this? Um, if I'm grateful that Jesus is, is my Lord, then, then how will that impact my daily life? This morning, I'd like to suggest that it is, it's through our response, through the way we, we, we respond to these good things of God, that we can actually display a life of thanksgiving and a life of gratitude toward God. So this morning, I want to look at a few verses from 1 Peter chapter 2 with you. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we, we can discover five different spiritual realities that we can thank God for today. And each one of these invite a response. Um, they invite us to somehow respond with an with a I will uh, towards God. So let's read uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're just going to read the first three verses to start off with this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says, So Get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. So we can take those verses and respond in a way, in a thanksgiving kind of way. Here's a response of thanksgiving to those verses that I just read. We could say this. We could say that because God is good, I will 
invite him to refine my life. Because God is good, I will invite him to refine my life. You know, when I was just six years old, I I remember I, I knelt down at the side of my bed. My parents were there with me. And I invited Jesus Christ into my life. That's that's a memory I can still uh, I still have many years later. Uh, from that moment, I began to learn more about God and and the Bible and what it what it really means to to live for Jesus. Um, along the way, there were many times when I've experienced the refining work of God in my life. This refining has has repeatedly shaped and formed me over and over and over and over and over again over the past 40 years. There's always more work to do in my attitudes, my actions, my thoughts, and my character. And and God just lovingly and patiently offers to refine my life. When you think of something being refined, you could think of a blacksmith who's working with with a heavy piece of iron. That iron is is placed into a blazing hot fire where it begins to be refined. The heat begins to break it down until it becomes molten hot. And then that heat, it, it just, that intense heat, it causes the impurities that are in that iron to be burned away. Any blemishes or weaknesses are exposed and and the iron is able to be strengthened. The blacksmith will remove it out from the fire and and then he'll begin to hammer it, skillfully shaping and forming it with each strike. And then that final product is something that's pure and that's strong and useful. Well, I sure feel like that piece of metal sometimes. When when I place my life in, in the hands of God, the refiner, he begins to go to work removing impurities from my life, exposing weaknesses, shaping me in a way that pleases him. Peter, in those verses, he said that we should get rid of all evil behavior and deceit and hypocrisy and jealousy and unkind speech. If you want to live for God, then then those things, they need to go, need to be done with. These verses, they describe a reality to our relationship with God that's that's important for us to recognize. Spiritual growth is, is a lifelong process that includes many moments of change and transformation and refining. For me, the, the refining work of God is, has not always been easy. It's not always been comfortable. But it always brings those needed changes to my understanding. Or, or they bring, it brings growth to my faith. It, it brings formation to my character. And all of this is a blessing. I can give thanks to God for his refining work in my life. Peter, in those verses, he used a word picture to describe our lives. He, he says we are like, like newborn babies in need of some milk uh, so that we can grow up and become spiritually mature. That's his way of saying that that when it comes to our faith, we all need to grow. We we all need a refiner. We need God to teach us, to to form us, to cleanse us, to change us, to grow us, to refine us. I've been a Christian for 40 years now, and I have tasted of the Lord's kindness and his goodness more times than I could share with you. He is so, so good. And because God is good, I will invite him to refine my life. This Thanksgiving, we can give thanks that that God is good by inviting him and by inviting his refining work to be done in each of our lives. Let's look back at 1 Peter chapter 2 at these next verses. I want to read verses 4 to 8 with you. Here's what they say. They say, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, 
I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you must trust him. You who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. Well, there was a lot there, but, but I want you to know that these are words of thanksgiving. They tell us that, that because Jesus is Lord, my faith has a rock-solid foundation. Because Jesus is Lord, my faith has a rock-solid foundation. You know, there is a lot of interest in spiritual things in our world these days. With all kinds of beliefs and practices claiming to be an, an authentic way to meet God or to know God. That tells us that there is a longing in the human heart for, for spiritual reality. St. Augustine, he once said this, he said that the heart is restless until it rests in God. But we need to be careful in Peter's mind, whatever defines your spirituality, other than faith in Jesus, the Son of God, is counterfeit and false. For Jewish Christians, this meant that all of, those, all of that emphasis on, on circumcision or on animal sacrifices and, and temple worship, it had to go. For Greek Christians, their belief in a, in a host of gods and in a wide range of superstitious practices that had to be left behind. And the reason is clear. Through Jesus, God laid a new cornerstone for faith. There's only one way to God. Every other form of spirituality is empty. Those who reject Christ so, so that they can embrace other sources of truth or spirituality, they are deceived. In his book, True Spirituality, Francis Schaeffer makes the point this way. He says, It is impossible even to begin living the Christian life or to know anything of true spirituality before one is a Christian. And the only way to become a Christian is neither by trying to live some sort of a Christian life, nor by hoping for some sort of religious experience, but rather by accepting Christ as Savior. No matter how complicated, educated, or, for, or sophisticated we may be, or how simple we may be, we must all come the same way. Our true guilt, which stands between us and God, can be removed only upon the basis of the finished work of Christ, plus nothing on our part. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter affirms that when a person welcomes Christ as their Savior, they are born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is the rock, the cornerstone, the foundation that our faith is built upon. And because Jesus is Lord, my faith has a rock-solid foundation. Faith in Jesus is, is strong enough to handle a health crisis, a financial struggle, marriage issues, family breakdown, sinful temptations, fear and worry, attacks and persecution, doubts and questions. Whatever we face, it's always going to be true. Because Jesus is Lord, my faith has a rock-solid foundation. Well, a few weeks after we moved into Carstairs, which is just over eight years ago now, I, I was outside in our driveway one evening when I, when I looked over and I saw my neighbor, Rene. He was, he was standing in the middle of the street. I, hadn't really gotten to, I didn't really know Rene that well at that point. And so I walked over and thought I'll try to go have a little visit with him. And I, I asked him what he was doing in the middle of the road. He was standing in the middle of the street and he, he was looking up and down, facing all of the houses that were built and, and just kind of looking at them one by one. So he said to me, he said, I, I'm trying to figure out something. He said, someone told me that a priest just moved, in, moved on to my street in the last few weeks. And so I'm standing out here in the road because I want to figure out who it is. <laughs> well, I kind of just stood by him for another minute or two and let him 
look at all the houses. And then I said to him, I said, well, well, Renee, I, I'm not a priest, but I am a pastor. And I, I work at a church that's just outside of Carstairs. And I told him where I work at Bethel Church. He turned around and he looked at me, he pointed at me, he said, it's you. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Well, over the next few years, we, we had the opportunity to have Renee and Joanne in our home many times, and they bought Christmas presents for our kids, which was amazing. I officiated their daughter's wedding. We hosted in our home a, a neighborhood farewell party for them when they decided to move to Edmonton. Well, it, it might feel like a stretch to view yourself as a priest, but that's the image that, that Peter wants you to have in verse 5. He's talking about your spiritual identity in Christ. Peter says that the believers are given the wonderful opportunity to offer spiritual sacrifices to God every day. Your worship, your prayers, your service, your talents, your heart, your life are, are all sacrifices that God receives with great joy. This is the way, this is how we can display this, this life of thanksgiving towards God. Let's read the next verse, verse 9. It says there, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Well, those verses give us a lot to be thankful for today. They say to us that because I belong to Christ, I belong to the church. Because I belong to Christ, I belong to the church. The collection of descriptive titles for the church in this chapter are just stunning. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a spiritual house, a temple made of living stones a holy nation, a people belonging to God, his, his possession. But, but what should be even more stunning is that this is where you belong. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then that's where you belong. It, it's the community of believers that makes the church so magnificent. It's the collective force of, of unity in Christ that empowers the church to make a difference in our world. Peter's point is that if you see yourself as an, as an individual believer with, with no need for the church or with any type of community of faith around you, then you need to change your thinking. The church is, is the collective expression of faith in Jesus Christ in the world. Every believer plays an important role. Every, every believer belongs. I recently read the story of a of a 50-year-old woman who had been placed in an orphanage as a newborn baby girl as after her parents had died in a, in a vehicle accident. Here's what she wrote when she wrote out her story. She said, it, it always seemed like no one wanted me, but I longed to be adopted and loved by a family as far back as I can remember. I thought about it day and night, but everything I did seemed to go wrong. I must have tried too hard to please the people who came to look me over. And what I did was just drive them away. But then one day, the head of the orphanage told me that a family was coming to take me home with them. I was so excited that I jumped up and down with tears running down my cheeks. The matron reminded me that I was on probation and that this might not be a permanent arrangement. But I just knew that somehow it would work out. So I went with this family and started going to school. I was the happiest little girl you can imagine, and, and life began to open up for me just a little. But then one day, a few months later, I raced home from school and ran into the front door of the big old house that we lived in. No one was at home. But in the middle of the front hall was my packed up and battered suitcase, all packed with my stuff, with my little coat thrown across the top of it. As I stood there, it suddenly dawned on me what this meant. I didn't belong there anymore. 
someone from the orphanage arrived a short time later and, and took me back to the orphanage with them. This happened to me seven times before I was 13 years old. But then she says this. She says, but wait. Eventually, I did find a home where the people loved me and, and they loved God. And it was after I discovered God in the church that I finally found what I had always longed for, a place to belong and a forever family. Well, in one way or another, all of us ask ourselves, where do I belong? Where do I belong? And as believers in Christ, our answer is, because I belong to Christ, I belong to the church. I want to read verse 10 of chapter 2 with you. Here's what it says. It says, Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. You have received God's mercy. What a sentence. Now that is something to give thanks for today. You have received God's mercy. If this is true for you, then that means that because of God's mercy, I can offer hope to others. Because of God's mercy, I can offer hope to others. You know, one of our deep longings in life is to know that our life has significance. Uh, once there was a little boy who, who wanted to play darts with his dad, uh, where he would throw, throw darts. So he said, Dad, let's play darts. He said, I'll throw the darts and you say, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, well, as, as Christians, though, it's, it's, it's not so much about how wonderful we are. It's all, all about the wonderful thing that God has done for us. In, in verse 10, Peter boils down the Christian experience to two different realities. First, responding to Christ for salvation means that you have received a new, unchangeable Identity. You are one of God's people. And this is only true because of the second reality. That this was only possible because of the mercy of God. We are all a bunch of undeserving sinners. Blessed beyond what we deserve. Blessed beyond what we deserve. Who are feasting at the table of God's grace. I want to show you something here for a moment. Just let me grab it for you. We have, uh, we have this sign that's in our basement of our house. And um, it's kind of set up on a feature wall that my wife set up with a bunch of pictures of our family and, and things like that. And, and this sign reminds me. Every time I look at it, it reminds me of God's grace and God's mercy in my life. My own personal story is just filled. <laughs> it's filled with so many mistakes and so many regrets and so many wrong choices and failures. At any point, God could have rejected me and cast me aside. That's probably what I deserved if I was being honest. But God hasn't done that. Instead, he's offered me his endless mercy and grace. He's blessed me beyond what I deserve. And because of this, my response to all that he's done for me is to do whatever I can to share and to offer that same kind of mercy and grace to others. I have the opportunity, and so do you, to represent a hope from God to all the people that I meet, to all the people that I visit with. My life and yours, your life, can declare the glory of Christ and his mercy, helping others know the way to God is the greatest achievement in life. Just listen to this. These are words from Jesus. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. 
Let's just read these final two verses of this passage. Verses 11 and 12. It says, Dear friends, I I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Peter ends this passage by by talking about our, our relationship as Christians to the world around us. He wants us to understand and to give thanks for our connection to God and also our connection to our surrounding community and culture. Today we can say that that because of God's love, I have been sent to share Christ with my neighbors. Because of God's love, I have been sent to share Christ with my neighbors. As believers, we, we sometimes struggle with the question, what is our connection to the culture around us? What is our connection to culture? The Christian life is, is a different life. It should look different than the world around us. And Peter makes it clear that, that there is a battle being waged over your soul. God's vision for holiness among his people requires discipline so that we can remain pure and we can abstain and, and stay away from sinful desires. But, but those desires are in our face all the time. There are things in our world that we need to keep away from, and Peter said that. So how are we to connect with our culture when so much of it runs contrary to the life that God calls us to? Well, it's tempting to just say we're just going to withdraw. We're just going to build up our walls. We're just going to shut out the world around us. But just hold on with that. How can you and I fulfill the Great Commission unless we are actively interacting with our culture? Peter's response here is helpful to us. Behind all of the, all of the normal activities that consume our lives, Christians hold these two realities in balance. First, the battle for your soul is real. If you are not careful, culture will swallow you up. You need to know that your relationship to culture should never overpower your allegiance to Jesus Christ. In this sense, you are a foreigner. You are a stranger in the culture and in the world. You must win the battles that that war against your soul and and keep you from being consumed by by sinful desires. But here's the second reality. Remember that you are a living witness for Jesus. You are a living witness for Jesus, and, and people are watching you all the time. So what, or or maybe who, do you want them to see? The best way to silence critics those who are critical of the church or of Christians or of faith, the best way to silence the critics is to let them see the reality of Christ in your life. We have to stay connected to culture because, because it's filled with, with people that matter to God, that people, people that God loves and people that God wants to draw into relationship with him. So you have been given a personal assignment from God just for you. He has chosen you to be his representative representative to to your unbelieving family members, to, to those people that you work with, to your neighbors, to those that you do business with. Because of God's love, I and you, we've we've been sent to share Christ with my neighbors. So when we look at all of those together. Can we say today that we have some things to be thankful for? We sure do. I'm going to put these five summary statements that, that we take from 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to put those on the screen here for a moment. And I, I want you to invite you to just read them out loud with me. Even if you're sitting in your home, if you're by yourself, just read these out loud with me as they're up here on the screen in a moment. This is our Thanksgiving checklist for today. I give thanks 
Because God is good, I will invite him to refine my life. Because Jesus is Lord, my faith has a rock-solid foundation. Because I belong to Christ, I belong to the church. Because of God's mercy, I can offer hope to others. Because of God's love, I have been sent to share Christ with my neighbors. Well, happy Thanksgiving to all of you that are watching. Uh, Just hope you have a wonderful weekend and that you just remember again these blessings and these gifts that God has given to you. We all have so much to thank God for. These spiritual realities that we've talked about this morning, they are they are foundational to us and, and they compel us. They motivate us to offer our lives to God in response. It, it, that is the way that we live this, this life of thanksgiving to God. This God who is good and who is merciful and who is loving in every way. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you, God, for, for blessing me much more than I deserve. Can you say that this morning? I sure can. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this morning and for this service and uh, for this weekend where we just often do take some time to pause and to reflect and to remember those things that we can be thankful for and those things we have received from you. And thank you for this passage of Scripture that maybe directs our thoughts in a, to some of those unseen unseen spiritual realities, these foundational things in our lives. and Lord, we don't just say these as statements. We want to now respond and offer ourselves as um, uh, just, just these lives of thanksgiving that are being offered to you in response for all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for, for the many blessings you've done. And Lord, at the top of the list, we, we place Jesus. We place the cross and the victory that Jesus uh, earned for our salvation, for the way that 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 gap that's between us and God the Father was was bridged by Jesus and the things that he's done for us. The ways that we can walk in relationship with you and and know that we are accepted and know that we we belong to you and that you offer yourself to us, that we have the, the strength of God, the grace of God, the love of God alive in us and and, and then and then able to be offered to the world around us. So Lord, we, we have a lot to say thankful for, or to say thank you for. Lord, this morning I do want to just remember a, a few people in our church family who are just walking through some challenges and are just in need of your grace and your care in some special ways right now. I want to pray for Teresa Whitlow and, and just this uh, journey that she's on with cancer. We ask, Lord, you'd You'd be very close to her right now, providing comfort and strength in all the ways that she needs. Lord, that you would be a healer in her life. And we ask that that in Jesus' name, that you would bring healing and restoration to her body. Lord, I want to pray for the Kenzie family. Um, Marvin's brother Brent passed away recently, and we just want to pray for them as they're grieving and and just uh, uh, walking through this time of loss with uh, with Brent. I pray, Lord, that that you'd be a, a source of comfort to all of them right now. Lord, I want to remember Brian and Judy Taylor um, on this Thanksgiving Monday. J- Judy uh, and, and her family have been planning and preparing a memorial service for Judy's mom, Loretta Danielson. Thank you for Loretta, for her love for you and for her testimony. We pray that will just be a wonderful time to celebrate her life and to honor her and and that uh, just the testimony of her life will have an impact on all, the, all who are there. Lord, I want to remember Nathan Lucas, and he's asked us to pray for his uncle, who's also walking through some very serious health challenges right now, and we pray that you'd be at work in his life too, Lord. Lord, there's many things that we, uh, we just ask for your, your prayers. We ask, ask for your help with. We, we just depend on you in so many ways. I pray your blessing on all those who are watching this video. Lord, there's uh, some from our church that are watching each week, and I haven't seen them for a long time. And I I pray they would just experience your love and your care, your strength and your power, uh, the ways that you bring uh, peace and hope into our lives, that, Lord, all of that would be their reality. Thank you, Lord, for the ways you are so close to us.
In Jesus' name, amen.